All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 82, bringing you all the best JavaScript news in the podcast form. And we got another week where, well, there's not that many things happening, to be honest. As you can see, the list is like super short. So, um, yeah, as usual, let's get cracking with the getting started section. We have some, well, some stuff here today. The first one is this uh, tweet. Um, how do you call it? Tweet thread that is called learn react in 10 tweets with hooks. And it is literally everything you got to know to learn react. Well, in a Twitter format, essentially, if you are coding JavaScript and you wanted to get into react, but didn't want to spend time reading the documentation, then this might be really good. Like this is actually a really good explanation of how react works. So if you know, it does assume you know JavaScript, so you won't be able to learn it if you are absolute beginner. But if you want to migrate to React, this is a really good starting point. So do check it out. All right. Next thing we got here is how to collect, customize and centralize Node.js logs. This is a pretty nice tutorial on Winston JS and using the transports to aggregate and centralize your logging. Uh, if you are new to backends and you never work with login centralization, you never heard about Winston, then do check this one out. It does a pretty good job of introducing it, describing how the transports work, how do you centralize stuff, and then how do you analyze it? Well, in this case, I think they specifically talk about their own uh, Datadog platform, but you know, there's Elasticsearch, Kibana, and all that stuff if you want to go open source. But a pretty nice tutorial anyway. Uh, hey, Kepler, welcome to the stream. I've been using Winston for a long time. It's a very good log aggregator. Yes, indeed. I've been using Winston for quite some time as well. And when you want distributed logging with like transport support and you know, the fancy features, it is actually really good. So can recommend it as well. Absolutely. Okay, continuing we got working with GitHub actions, a very detailed like just look at the length of this thing very detailed write up on uh, working with GitHub Actions and not just, you know, writing your own workflows, but also building your own GitHub Actions using Node.js, JavaScript and uh, Actions packages from uh, GitHub itself. So if you are interested in GitHub Actions, if you are interested in building your own GitHub Actions, the custom ones that would do something that is currently not done, I mean, it, it works really well actually for, you know, automating the repeated tasks. And uh, yeah, this guide basically has everything you ever want to know about building your own actions, uh, even with, you know, TypeScript integration, stuff like this testing, it is insanely detailed. So again, if you're interested in GitHub actions, and wasn't sure where to start, then do check this out. I would say this is probably even more comprehensive than the official docs right now. Because you know, even the uh, like the GitHub actions is still in beta. So let's give them some slack. But the official documentation is lacking in a lot of places. Like sometimes you just have to go into the GitHub actions uh, issues, tickets and community to actually found, uh, find the correct answers. But um, this article has everything you got to know to get started with building your own and using them in your custom workflows. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, continuing, we got thinking in React hooks, a very nice introduction to React hooks and how do the old class based React components translate into the new React hooks workflows. So if you are using React, and if you want to migrate to hooks, but didn't have time to go through the official docs and want something a bit more condensed, then do check this one out. It's actually very visual. There's this super nice, um, I don't even know how to call that. It's like chart. I mean, it's not chart exactly, right? It's just like code mappings, I guess, that make it very um, obvious. How do you take the old methods and convert them into new uh, React hooks, like the class methods translate to React hooks and your components? There's also a comparison of length of lines, which is you know not the best way to do that, but hey. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in hooks and wanted to migrate from your old react components, do check this one out. It's actually quite good. All right, continuing, we got lessons from building node apps in Docker uh, 2019. This is a pretty nice write up on uh, how do you dockerize your node.js apps like there is a lot of different things in here starting from, uh, you know, working with volumes, changing the base, uh, the default user that is used in a Docker container, um, 
in starting quiet, caching your dependencies and stuff like this. So if you are just getting started working with Node.js and you want to dockerize it, but are not sure about specifics, maybe you want to see some tricks and best practices and stuff like this, this is the article to read. It's actually quite good and there's a lot of very valid points in here. Um, I mean, in general, it's like this article does have a lot of stuff, but majority of time you don't actually need to do a lot of that. It's like, yes, it's a good practice to, you know, change the user and make the folders and copy the files from that specific user, but it's not like you have to do this. If you know that your server is isolated and you are the only one who's gonna be running stuff in there, it doesn't matter if it's root or not. And like, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm still, anyway, you know, this is a good advice is here. So if you're curious, do check it out. Okay, continuing. Uh, we are actually done with the getting started section. So as I said, you know, the podcast today is super tiny. Um, now we got the articles and news uh, and we do have some very awesome stuff here today. So the first article we got here is Void Call Making Off. This is a write up uh, from the author of the Void Call. This is a real time strategy that is an entry to the GS 13K games competition. So it's a 13 kilobyte real time strategy written in JavaScript with WebGL, 3D and all that kind of stuff. And uh, whoops, no, I don't want a full screen, please. Thank you very much. Um, for some reason, um, for some reason, I'm not sure why exactly this happens, but um, it doesn't really, come on. I know you can, what, what is, is it because I have like shift or alt or control? It happened the last time as well, but for some reason it doesn't start selecting units from the very beginning, but at one point it just starts working properly. But it is like a full on real time strategy where you can, oh, there you go. I guess maybe it's a tutorial. Um, you can build like, you know, turrets and you can build like extractors. I'm not sure, I guess from this or something. I'm not sure, it, sa it says you need to build it on a well, but I'm not sure where the well is. And the cool thing is like you have a full on map, you have enemies attacking, you have different kinds of units, you have like a healer, you have your, uh, you know, soldiers, it is and all of that in 13 kilobytes of Java. Just think about that for a second. And the article goes into detail of um, explaining how exactly was that fitted into 13 kilobytes, which is absolutely fascinating read like there is a lot of different tips and tricks here on how to minimize the footprints in, you know, both, you know, from generating the terrains going into models because the models are very low poly as you can notice here. So as it says here, the main character model is 36 vertices, 62 faces and six animation frames compressed to 572 bytes. Just think about that for a second. This is insane. So if you have even slightest interest in making highly optimized, very tiny video games, just do check it out. It is freaking awesome. Uh, hey, JD Hirsch, welcome to the stream. Okay, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, you know, js 13 k overall is just a fascinating event to keep track of, and we're gonna talk about it a bit later. But uh, yes, once again, if you are interested in specifics of building 3D games in 13 kilobytes, which is mind blowing, do check this one out. Continuing, we got performance metrics for blazingly fast web apps. A pretty interesting insight into how, um, I guess in one specific use case more than everything, into how uh, how to track performance metrics, uh, when to use which clock, as in, you know, you cannot really use new date because it's not exactly precise and stuff like performance.now is way more precise because it was built specifically for performance. And then some additional stuff like, hey, you might actually not want to track specific timing, but you want to track specific timing intervals and then ignore painting and layouting because this is not something you want to measure. So if you are into performance and if you need to track performance of your front end application, um, do check it out. There is some very interesting thoughts here. Uh, one of the possibly the most interesting uh, observation I found was this, you know, uh, multiple thresholds grouping. So instead of tracking the actual time, you track the uh, groups of performance within the specific tasks, right? And then you visualize them on the screen like this to see whether your code is fast enough in majority of cases, I guess, which is an interesting approach. And I guess, you know, for the most of the time it works. 
Obviously, if you have enough budget, you want to go green like 100%, but you know, sometimes it's just not possible and not financially or otherwise viable, which is, um, again, you know, leads to this kind of approach. So if you are interested in performance tracking and front end apps, do check this one out. There is quite a bit of interesting info here. All right, continuing, we got React Lazy, a take on preloading views, how to add preloading to your root based code split apps. So this is a look into the React Lazy. So this is, you know, your uh, integrated React Lazy loading for components that we have for about a year now, I guess. And how do you actually use preloading to faster fetch the components that are going to be required sooner, as you know, right? The, um, I mean, the pattern is actually super simple, which I found to be pretty cool. So the idea is that you actually wrap your uh, import statement in React Lazy, and then you add to that component dot preload method that is literally just your import statement. So whenever you want to preload, you just say, hey, my component dot preload, and that would trigger that import statement to be loaded, which means that the next execution within the component render would be immediate instead of, you know, waiting for the whole thing to fetch which is super straightforward, but it seems to be working really well. And uh, yeah, it's quite nice. So if you, if that sounds interesting, if you use pre, uh, sorry, if you use React Lazy and want a preloading, do check this one out. It's a pretty neat pattern. And uh, I, yeah, I guess you could wrap this up into a super tiny library, but I'm not sure you would need to because it's like literally four lines of code. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is an HTML attribute potentially worth 4.4 million to Chipotle. Now, I don't necessarily agree with the whole business calculation side of this thing, because that's not really how the business works. But the deep dive into the form completion and correct attributes on the forms is very fascinating. So the problem here is that the Chipotle has the online ordering form and they have the card autofill there, right? So you can autofill your card. But for some reason, if you do autofill the cards, the form breaks, right? And the author here goes into deep dive to figure out why exactly this happens because he's 100% sure his autofill is valid and works totally fine, right? Now, the problem is that the form has custom validation logic that basically cuts the uh, card year into the two digits, which means that if your autofill has year 2023 or whatever, and this form will mask it, it will mask it to 20, not 23, right, which is wrong data. So your credit card company will reject the payment. And all that could be fixed by just specifying length two on your field so that you would immediately uh, basically cut it to the correct thing, right. And I mean, okay, then then he goes into calculations of how much money they lost because of this, which I, I don't think that works this way. But you know, that's a different question. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's a pretty interesting uh, deep dive into the form validation and uh, sort of pre preference to use the default input features over custom validation methods, because it's always more reliable. So if you're working with forms, do check it out. There is some interesting lessons to pick up here. All right. Um, I think this is the last article we have here today in articles and news. It's titled Why JavaScript Tooling Sucks. So um, the whole premise here is that yes, JavaScript tooling went a long way, right? So with like, if you compare the JavaScript today with JavaScript, we had, I don't know, in 2009, or even before that, it is a lot better. But the tooling is still really hard to use, like this is the main point, right? So the tooling is is too hard to use, and it's not your fault. And this is from uh, Swix. He is a quite avid open source contributor, I believe he's like one of the guys who contributes to Gatsby, for example, and he has like a ton of tooling packages that he maintains himself. So all of this criticism is not coming random from a random, you know, person on the internet It's actually coming from one of the authors of this set tooling, and he deep dives and, and looks why exactly tooling is it stated it is? Why is it hard? And what can we actually do to make it better? And it's not just the technical reasons like, you know, hey, JavaScript wasn't actually made for this originally, but it's evolved since quite a bit. Uh, you know, that we have this insanely large community, 
we have the moving targets and moving goalposts. This is actually one of the reasons that I think a lot of people miss because JavaScript is not just a single runtime, right? We have like insane number of runtimes and all of them kind of work in the same way, which is, you know, this ephemeral goal of um, Java, which is like, you know, once right run everywhere, which never kind of worked out for Java. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a very interesting deep dive into the whole state of it. Uh, along with more kind of, I guess, social slash political topics uh, of, you know, stuff like, hey, we actually treat tool makers as tools, you know, the people who go ahead and complain about um, open source free tooling and get annoyed that their issue is not fixed immediately. And the same goes for like funding and stuff like this. It is very interesting. So again, if you have any interest in open source, if you have any interest in JavaScript tooling specifically, not necessarily technical, I would encourage you to read that. There is a lot of interesting thoughts here. And it's just, yeah, very nice deep dive into the current state of JavaScript tooling, I guess. The title is clickbaity and very provocative, but you know, intentionally so. All right, that is actually it for news and articles. Again, very tiny podcast today. Um, now we got a few tips, tricks and bit-sized uh, awesome bits. Bit-sized awesome bits sounds terrible, so let's not do that again. All right, the first thing is, um, today I learned that if you visit DevTools source tab, right after using performance tab, you get benchmarks, which is something I didn't know as well before seeing that tweet and something that is absolutely awesome. So if you open your uh, inspect tab, right? If you go to the performance tab, then you start uh, like benchmarking, then you reload your page or whatever, collect the profile for performance, stop it, and then go into the source tab, and obviously, I guess it won't really work that well for minified source. Um, okay, this is not what we want. Is there like some JavaScript here actually somewhere? I'm not I'm not sure Twitter was a good idea to, there we go, there's a bundle. Yeah, the problem is it doesn't work well with bundles because it writes performance per line, which you know, in production is basically useless. But if you run that in development mode, and I tried that, it actually gives you some really cool metrics about your code. So you can actually see, you know, okay, this for loop takes 100 milliseconds. So, hey, maybe you want to adjust something or memoize it or whatever, which is actually really damn helpful. So if you are um, care about performance, basically, do take note of this feature. Next thing we got here is a commit to Chromium to V8 specifically. So the top level await finally landed in V8 along with a bunch of tests. And I believe the test version of Node.js is already available. So if you want to pull from the pre-built test Node.js binary, you can actually play around with top level await, which is a quite welcome change. And next thing we got here is this nice pattern that I never actually thought about before. Um, so, you know, everyone knows that if you use a sync await, if you await two promises uh, sequentially, this basically will block, right? So it will first get the cats and then get the dogs, which if they are independent, you can do this in parallel. So the typical approach is to say, okay, promise all and then just destruct the results with array destruction. Uh, no, destructuring is what I want to say. But there's another pattern, right? So which probably would work nice for two or three promises, but will be absolute hell to read if you have like five or six. Nonetheless, it's a really cool idea. So the idea is that you first generate the promises and then you await them in the next step, which would mean the promises, the execution will start over here, but both of them will await over here, right? So they will kind of execute apparently anyway, which is uh, pretty damn nice. So it's a nice pattern. And you know, if you have just two promises, maybe three, it might be a lot more readable than uh, promise all actually. All right, this is it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we're coming to the releases. The first major release of the week is V8 version 7.8, bringing us the JavaScript performance improvements. Uh, there is the script streaming on preload, which is a pretty nice and welcome improvement that should significantly improve the execution time for the pages. Uh, it says the yeah, other five to 20% on average, which is pretty damn. And every time I see metrics from the V8 releases, it is mind blowing. How do they, it's seven, 78 versions, right? And uh, every version, five to 10 to 20% performance improvements. How the hell do they manage to do that? Tell me. 
Okay, but whatever, um, I'm just writing here now. So there is um, faster objects destructuring. So this pattern will now be a lot faster than before. You no longer have to manually optimize for it. Um, we got lazy source positions. So this is the one of the, I believe, features uh, that was backported from the light mode. And there's like one to 2.5 reduction in V8 memory usage, which is quite welcome and nice. There's a uh, faster regular expression match failures. And then there is the WebAssembly stuff with C, C++ API, which is quite nice and improved startup time for WebAssembly code, which is also cool. So if you are interested, do check out the release notes. Again, mind blowing every time to read that stuff. It is, I wonder how longer they can keep up with this. It's just crazy. Okay, next release we got here is React Native version 0.61 with fast refresh. So the fast refresh being the highlight of this release. And honestly, if you ever worked with mobile developments, this stuff looks like magic. So first of all, you can now break your code and it will actually still hot reload the app so you don't have to force reload it any longer. And just look at this. So you literally edit CSS and it immediately happens on the screen. This is insane. Like this looks so awesome. Uh, this like literally, you know, for someone who built iOS apps back when SDK was like version 1.0, oh, this looks like plain out magic. <laughs> and it's great to see. Uh, obviously, there's some other improvements. So if you are interested, do check it out. There are some breaking changes. So make sure to read through that if you are upgrading from version 0.60. Uh, from what I've seen online, uh, from the feedback of people upgrading, it actually is pretty painless. And there is a migration script. So uh, yeah, do check them out. All right, next thing we got here is React Router version 5.1. It is a minor release, but it does include a ton of new features that are really awesome. Uh, namely, there is a bunch of hooks that you can now use to make things a lot easier for you. Like, for example, use params. So instead of passing those params from the root as you would, you know, doing the component, you can now just rest your uh, nest your component within the route and then just use use params hooks to actually extract those params just using the context, which is, uh, or at least I assume this it uses the context. But uh, anyway, it looks a lot cleaner and a lot nicer. You also now have the use location hook that you can use, for example, at top level to do Google Analytics or whatever you want, basically, which also looks nice. You got the use history hook, which allows you to access history instead of, you know, manually getting it from or passing it from wherever from your um, application, which was a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest. And then you got use route match, which also allows you to yeah just match sub routes i guess and render whatever you want which is uh quite nice so this is i believe the preparation for the react router uh six release which will have breaking changes but if you update now to use those hooks which i mean let's be honest they look a lot cleaner than just using the components at least in my opinion you should have less problems migrating to version six. And there's also the article, the release notes uh, basically have the explanation of what you have to do to prepare for version six migration. So there you go. Right, next release we got here is Ava version 2.4. The reason I'm highlighting this is because they have this experimental try assertion, which sounds very interesting. But one problem is, is they like, we want your feedback on this try assertion that we haven't documented. Now, the thing is, so the assertion itself, it basically allows you to try to do something. And then once it's done, you can decide whether you want to commit it to test or discard the result of that, which sounds very interesting. But again, the problem is there is no documentation. There is an open issue with docu saying document try, which, you know, it's a bit feels a bit weird that they try to ask for feedback when it's not properly documented. But there is like, if you go around and check uh, some of the links here, there are some documentation here and there. And it seems to be relatively straightforward. But the feature itself is actually very interesting. So I'll be curious to see when they completely release it with like non experimental and with proper docs, what can you actually achieve with that. But uh, yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. The next release and the last release of this week we got here today is Node.js version 12.11. We got uh, updates to V8 version 7.7, .7, which is nearly the, like it's we're we're this close to getting uh, basically V8 releases on almost the same day as they come out. 
Uh, obviously, we get like efficient memory handling, install number format, and a bunch of other stuff. I think we talked about it a couple of podcasts ago. And another cool highlight is that worker threads are now stable, so you can safely use them and be happy with that, basically. Okay, that is it for the releases. Now we got a couple of libraries and demos. The first one today is Robots, which is a one kilobyte functional library for creating finite state machines. It actually looks really cool. Like if you need to work with finite state machines or if you prefer to work with finite state machines, this is probably one of the most elegant APIs that I've seen so far on the JavaScript um, library market, let's put it this way. So yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It actually looks really good. Okay, next thing we got here is Stubborn, a Node.js web server to mock external APIs responses for testing purposes. So it actually looks um, very similar to NOC, but it says um, that basically the difference is that instead of doing it like NOC, right, it sort of will match the request based on the definitions like NOC, but will do it in a separate web server like the Dyson does. So sort of combination of Dyson and NOC which I found to be interesting. I like, I don't know what the advantage of this will be because so far, at least in my cases, knock was usually enough, but maybe you know why you would want to combine two. So do check it out. The API seems to be very similar to knock, but then again, you know, the difference is that it runs actually a separate web server when it does all the matching, which again, I don't know why it would be useful, but probably it will be at some point. So do check it out. Okay. Next thing we got here is KF Chess, Kung Fu Chess, uh, the real like tiny game that I found to be pretty cool. So it's basically a real time chess that uh, instead of you know taking turns with your uh, opponent, you have um, the figures have the timeout, right? So you can move them and then there's a timeout or when they can move again, which is uh, an interesting notion and uh, it is open source. So if you want to check how it was built, you can do it right here in the source code. It's pretty fun and a pretty good um, projects to learn, you know, how to do games like this. Okay. Continuing, we got Geometric, a JavaScript library for doing geometry. Yes, this has all the functions that you might ever want, or I guess majority of functions that you might ever want for working with points, lines, polygons, angles, areas, distances, and all the other geometry related stuff. Probably very good if you're working on a game, for example, because as you know, as I remember trying to build a game in JavaScript, geometry was probably one of those fields that you always like had to scratch your head, go into the wiki and try to figure out the formula that you actually have to use to figure out if the two objects collide. Uh, now you can just use a function here, which you know, is quite nice. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Deck Deck Go, the open source editor for presentations, also available as a full on demo right here. You can just start using it without registering or anything. Um, I guess my JavaScript is a bit blocked here. There we go. Come on, start working. No, what is happening? Uh, is it because of ad block? No. Okay, do you need iframes? Maybe it's down. Okay, last time I tried it, it actually worked for me fine, but uh, the thing is open source, so you can actually clone the repo and use it locally if you want to. It's a progressive web app, which is, um, you know, very nice. It, it looks actually pretty fancy. Like it has a lot of features and slides and remote presentation and sharing and everything. So if you are interested in markdown based uh, progressive web app for presentations, do check it out. It actually looks pretty solid. All right. Next thing we got here is ENDB, simple key value database with multiple adapter support. So it's sort of an high level abstraction for doing key value storage and it supports a ton of things, including level, Mongo, Redis, SQL, Postgres, and SQLite. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. The API is like super straightforward. You basically get, get set, all uh, has clear delete, and then there's math which I'm not sure what it does, but there you go. Um, yeah, if you ever need to work with multiple data key value stores, I'm not sure why you would want that, but um, there you go. Okay, and the last thing we are here for today in demos is the all list of all entries for JS 13K games. Uh, there is 245 of them, and some of them are absolutely bonkers. 
So if you are curious to see what can you fit into 13K, do check it out. It is, as I said, quite damn mind blowing. Some of those are just insane. I, by the way, cannot wait for the release, uh, sorry, for the final uh, results to see the top uh, because it's always, you know, the most fascinating, the most complex, the most crazy ones. I think the voting will end in, yeah, five days. So six days, essentially. So the next podcast will be talking about the um, results of this and I'm going to be more than happy to present you the winners, which is probably going to be crazy as hell. So there you go. But yeah, again, if you're interested, you can look through entries right now. They even have the categories. I have not noticed this last time. So there's even some web XR stuff. So if you have a VR helmet or AR capable phone, you can do check this out as well. And 13 kilobytes, just think about that. <laughs> okay, that is it for the libraries and demos. Now we have a couple of uh, interesting things to close this off. First announcement is that Hacktoberfest has actually start, well, almost started. We got what, two days, three days until it begins. You can already sign up for the uh, Hacktoberfest itself. You, as usual, need to submit four pull requests to any repos. Just submit, they don't have to be accepted. It's just they don't have, you know, like don't abuse it. They, if maintainers mark them as spam, you will not get your t-shirt. But if you submit four pull requests that are useful in some way, and you know, even if they get rejected or closed in the long run, you will still get your nice t-shirt from uh, Oktoberfest. So it's a very nice opportunity to contribute first time to any open source project you might be using. So do not sit out there, reach out to the maintainers, open a pull request, help them with something, even something small, like, you know, submit a docs change or documents, some additional th things. It's very easy. And get a very nice uh, t-shirt, which probably will have the Oktoberfest logo, which looks very, vapor wave <laughs> this time around but uh yeah you know just get hacking and they they have like a lot of uh, things that can help you basically uh go with that uh, and yes you have your progress and everything and i already signed up as you can see here cannot wait for yet another t-shirt and more contributions i don't know what i will try to contribute this time around but uh, last year i contributed to node.js i think and it was uh, pretty nice Right, and the last thing we got here for today is the um, announcement from Microsoft. They just published a new video series for beginners to learn Python programming, which seems to be pretty comprehensive and very nicely made. So if you are getting started with software development or maybe you're coding in JavaScript for quite some time and you wanted to dive into Python because there is a lot of you know deep learning, machine learning and AI happening in there essentially, well, now you can. Uh, they have a very nice set of videos that will guide you through everything, including even some machine learning uh, related stuff. So yeah, it's actually quite awesome to see something like this being published by Microsoft. Uh, you know, when I see stuff like this, I start to wonder if I should just go work for Microsoft because they, they've been doing so much cool stuff lately. It's like, it seems like a very fun place to work at. But uh, there we go. Right, that is actually it from my side. As I said, we <laughs> didn't really have that much stuff today again for some reason. I'm not sure what's up with the end of September. But um, yeah, that's basically it. So if you guys have any questions, suggestions, or you want to share your own projects or your links that I might have missed this week, do throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can wrap this up here as usual. You can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev website. We have a Discord server to discuss anything JavaScript or video games related. Um, you can join it and talk and ask for help and you know discuss things or share your projects. Uh, if you have anything to share, reach out to me on Twitter or Twitch or whatever the hell you want. Basically, I'm more than happy to cover your stuff. That's basically it. Uh, doesn't seem like we have any questions or suggestions. Um, I have read the tweet about the better async await pattern and I have to say insert turns that doesn't make work. What? Sounds good. Doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I said, right? So this pattern will work okay when you have like two, three promises, but as soon as you start having a lot of them, promise all would be a lot more readable. I totally agree with that sentiment and yes, but it's a very nice pattern when you have like, you know, two, three promises because it just looks cleaner and it's I'm probably easier to understand than promise all. 
at least faster to understand. Maybe I don't, I'm not sure, but it's not a bad pattern. Let's just let's just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Any more questions, suggestions, or anything you guys want? Let me try that again. Any more questions, suggestions, or anything else you want to guys? This what is wrong with me? I can't even pronounce the. Get it? okay. You know what? That's it. Doesn't seem like we have any more questions. So thank you guys very much for watching. As usual, if you missed it, there will be a VOD available immediately on Twitch or on YouTube in a few hours. That's basically it. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you are watching the VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.